Hi, and good afternoon to those for whom it's afternoon. Good morning to our friends on the West Coast. My name is Betsy Harned. I am the Vice President of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood of Metropolitan Washington, DC. I will be moderating today's program. And I'd like to welcome you to the latest webinar from the American Bar Association's Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice's Rights of Women's Committee, of which I am a member. This program is also co-sponsored with the ABA Criminal Justice Section, as well as the Commission on Women in the Profession. On behalf of the Bar Association, um, the ABA would like me to extend an invitation to everyone that if you like our work, we invite you to collaborate with us on projects that you want to develop and offer to ABA members and the general public. We're thrilled today to bring you today's program entitled Direct from the Doctors and Lawyers on the Front Lines, Abortion Access in America. During today's panel, I will, I will, I will, and I will introduce the panelists soon, we'll be hearing from uh, both doctors who provide abortions, as well as attorneys specializing in reproductive health, who will discuss the current landscape of abortion access from both the medical and the legal perspectives. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. American Bar Association has also asked that I relay that the views expressed herein have not been approved by the House of Delegates or the Board of Governors of the American Bar Association and accordingly should not be construed as representing the policy of the American Bar Association. They are the views of the individuals themselves in their personal and individual capacities. During today's programs, you can, and we encourage you to ask, ask us questions. Um, you will be finding a questions tab in the menu bar of the web program where you can type in your questions. There'll be time at the end for our panelists to address your questions. We will also be sharing a recording of the program to everyone who is registered so you can share it widely with your networks. Please feel free to leave us feedback or ask questions and follow up as well. In terms of the run of, in terms of, the run of show for today's program, each of the panelists will be giving a presentation and then we will, as I said, have time for questions at the end. Before I introduce our panelists, I do want to thank the American Bar Association for its attention to this important issue of access to reproductive health care. And also want to make sure that folks are aware, especially members and potential members of the ABA, that the ABA is on record supporting access to reproductive health care. The Nationwide American Bar Association has multiple policy positions on reproductive health care, including policy positions supporting legal access to abortion and opposing laws that impose barriers to access to abortion. Additionally, the American Bar Association has filed an amicus brief in June Medical Services v. Gee, which we will be talking about extensively today, encouraging the court to find the Louisiana, the Louisiana law at issue unconstitutional. Well, today we'll be, we will be focusing largely on the Supreme Court cases. Um, of course, we'll hear from the providers as to what abortion access is really like on the front lines. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about nationwide issues. We also thought that it would be helpful before we dive into our program to give a sense of what the state laws are like across the United States. And Ali, if you could forward to the next slide. We embark on today's program when this slide that I'd like to give credit to the uh, esteemed Guttmacher Institute for, it's available on their website. We embark on this program when this is the nature of state laws with respect to uh, access across the country. In many states, including where one of our panelists, Dr. Colleen McNicholas practices, Missouri, there are only, there's only one health center that provides abortion. And Ali, if you could forward to the next slide. Thank you. So here you will see states already in this in the United States, um, with Roe v. Wade being the law of the land, already having only one health center that provide abortion. And so it's with this backdrop, and um, the uh, again, thanks to the American Bar Association for its attention and its policies in promoting access to women's health care, um, uh, that I would like to introduce our panelists, and then I'll turn it over to them for presentations. First, we're going to hear from Mai Radakonda, who is a staff attorney at Planned Parenthood Federation of America in the Public Policy and Law Department. Mai received her law degree at Columbia Law School, and after graduating from law school, clerked for both the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut, as well as for the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. 
Of course, all of our panelists are distinguished and have wonderful uh, resumes and tons of credentials. I encourage you to look at the bios that will be provided by the ABA, and I'll just give a few of the highlights. We'll also be joined today by Joel Dodge, who's a lecturer of law and staff, at, a staff attorney at the Center for Reproductive Rights. He's a member of the Judicial Strategy Program at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Joel graduated from Boston University School of Law in 2014 and from the State University of New York at Geneseo in 2011. He also writes for prominent outlets, including The New Republic, The Nation, The Week, and The Washington Monthly. Our medical panelists include Dr. Serena Floyd, who's a board certified OBGYN and the current medical director at Planned Parenthood of the Metropolitan Washington, DC. Dr. Floyd did her undergraduate work at Emory and then went on to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she completed a dual degree program, receiving both her medical degree as well as a master's in public health with a focus on maternal and child health. Dr. Floyd I completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Duke University Medical Center, and in addition to her extensive medical practice, has served as faculty at both George Washington and Virginia Commonwealth Universities. Finally, Dr. Colleen McNicholas is an OBGYN and the Chief Medical Officer for Planned Parenthood of the St. Louis region and Southwest Missouri. She practices in St. Louis, Missouri at the Planned Parenthood Health Center, which is the only remaining health center providing abortions in Missouri. Dr. McNicholas specializes in family planning and abortion care, providing clinical care in four states across Missouri, the Midwest and the South. She also has been plaintiff to numerous challenges of state and federal laws and regulations, and has recently been recognized with a leadership award from the Human Rights Campaign. Thank you all for being here today. I am absolutely delighted. It's a privilege to moderate this distinguished panel, and I now would like to turn it over to Mai. Thanks, Betsy. Hi, um, my name is Mai. I'm a staff attorney, as Betsy mentioned, in the Litigation and Law Department of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Um, I apologize for my voice. It might start to give out. I'm recovering for a, from a cold, so I will try to power on through through this presentation. Uh, but, but before I dive into the substance of my presentation, I just wanted to give a brief background on uh, PPFA and our litigation. So PPFA is a national membership organization with around 50 members or affiliates throughout the country. And our affiliates provide healthcare at about 600 health centers. Um, the national office provides various kinds of support to our affiliates, including through my department litigation and law. Uh, the general mission of my department is to ensure that our affiliates are able to provide the full range of reproductive health care. So, if there are uh, regulations or laws that impede their ability to provide the full range of health care, uh, we you know, take a close, close look at that and, and see if litigation is an option. So the focus of my presentation today is to give some background on abortion litigation and including specifically on what has been happening in the lower courts uh, since the Supreme Court's whole women's health decision in 2016. So first, going back a few decades, uh, in 1973, the Supreme Court recognized the right to abortion as a fundamental liberty interest under the U.S. Constitutional, uh, in the Constitution in the case Roe v. Wade. And actually, yesterday was the 47th anniversary of Roe. So um, after Roe came out, there was some significant social and political backlash, especially among um, religious conservatives. And there were also changes made to the Supreme Court in terms of who was sitting on the bench. Uh, and so all of that led to the next big abortion decision from the Supreme Court, Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992. And in Casey, the Supreme Court upheld several Pennsylvania abortion restrictions and struck down a restriction as well. And it reaffirmed the core holding of Roe, recognizing that abortion is a protected right. And in Casey, the court announced a new standard for evaluating abortion laws. So the court asked lower courts to determine whether laws have the purpose or effect of creating an undue burden, or in other words, a substantial obstacle 
in the path of a woman choosing to have an abortion. And after Casey, abortion opponents decided to focus their energies on enacting abortion restrictions under the guise of protecting women's health. So, you know, they would pass these laws whose true purpose was to restrict abortion, but they would say that the real reason was to protect women's health. And one example of such a law is a law re requiring abortion providers to have admitting privileges at a hospital. And Joel will talk about that um, when he talks about the June medical case that's in front of the Supreme Court today or this year. So as, as these abortion restrictions started to get passed across the country, organizations and abortion providers wanted to sue uh, to say that these restrictions were unconstitutional and courts had to grapple with the KC standard to decide whether these laws posed an undue burden. And after KC, courts from different circuits started interpreting the law very differently. So, for example, more conservative courts, like in the Fifth Circuit, they interpreted Casey to mean that you never have to look at a court's or a state's justification in passing an abortion restriction. So you only look at the impact of the restriction. And in fact, the, the state doesn't even have to have an explicit justification for passing an abortion restriction. But there were other courts in the Seventh and Ninth Circuit, for example, who said that you do have to look at whether what the state's justification was and whether the law actually advanced a state's interest. And at the same time, you have to balance that against the impact of the law on the ground. So they, they, they um, used a balancing test. In 2016, um, the Supreme Court decided whole women's health. And the background of that was, you know, there were these different circuits who were interpreting the law differently in terms of how they were evaluating abortion restrictions. And in Whole Women's Health, the Supreme Court adopted the balancing analysis that was being done by the Seventh and the Ninth Circuits and, and other courts. And they said that courts like the Fifth Circuit, the conservative courts, were wrong to not examine the state's justifications. And, and ensure that the laws actually advanced a state interest. The restrictions at issue in women's health, there were two restrictions. One was um, an admitting privileges requirement, which I mentioned earlier, and another was a requirement that um, abortion facilities had to meet the, the standards of an ambulatory surgical center. And the Supreme Court looked really carefully at the evidence uh, and, and said that both of these restrictions were unconstitutional. And they said that uh, they were unconstitutional because, quote, neither of these provisions confer medical benefits sufficient to justify the burdens on access. So after Whole Women's Health, the lower courts were on notice that they really had to look carefully at both the benefits and the burdens and balance them to, to see whether an abortion restriction was constitutional. So while Whole Women's Health was being decided, there was some ongoing litigation in Tennessee. And uh, the Tennessee litigation involved two requirements. One was an admitting privileges requirement, and the other was an ambulatory surgical center requirement. So the same requirements that were in front of the Supreme Court. There was also an ongoing challenge in Alabama, and that involved an admitting privileges requirement. And after the Whole Women's Health decision came out, both Tennessee and Alabama decided that they were just not going to enforce those restrictions anymore. They were not going to pursue the litigation any further, and they were just going to abide by what the Supreme Court said and, and, and you know, strike down those restrictions, not enforce them any further. But not all of the states were that accommodating, unfortunately. And there were some states, especially in, uh, in, with courts that were conservative or hostile to abortion rights, there were some states that decided to pursue litigation anyway, even when the restrictions at issue were exactly the same or very similar to the ones that the Supreme Court had just struck down. And it turns out that those those states were actually kind of right to take their chances and move forward because conservative courts were able to interpret whole women's health in a way 
that were, was not as protective as the Supreme Court intended. So I'm gonna give you two examples. Um, and they are both from the very hostile Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Eighth Circuit just historically has been hostile to abortion providers and abortion rights. Uh, so two cases coming out of the Eighth Circuit after Whole Women's Health, one was from Missouri. And um, in Missouri, after Whole Women's Health, the Planned Parenthood provider decided to challenge two restrictions that had been in effect in the state. One was an admitting privileges requirement and the other was an ambulatory surgical center requirement. So again, the exact same requirements that were at issue in Whole Women's Health. And you know, we figured this should be a pretty easy case. The Supreme Court just said that these requirements are unconstitutional and they made a lot of great findings uh, in, in, uh, for abortion providers when they came out with that decision. And the district court agreed with us. The district court said, you're right, look at Whole Women's Health, look at what the Supreme Court said, these two restrictions are obviously unconstitutional. But the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the district court and it upheld the requirements and it did so by trying to limit the whole women's health case to its facts. So for example, looking at the benefit side, the Eighth Circuit said, okay, whole women's, in whole women's health, the Supreme Court said that abortion is very safe. And that's one of the reasons why the requirements were unnecessary and they didn't actually provide any benefits. But the Eighth Circuit said, well, whole women's health was about Texas. Those were requirements that were taking place in Texas. And, you know, Missouri might have some Missouri specific safety issues that we don't know about. The district court should have looked into this. District court didn't. So we're going to have to send this back to the district court. But if you look at Whole Women's Health, the Supreme Court, when they said that abortion is very safe and that's why these requirements provide no benefits, they looked at national data. They looked at data from all across the country to say that abortion is one of the safest medical procedures. But the Eighth Circuit just chose to kind of ignore that inconvenient fact and, and said, oh, that's just a Texas specific case. This is Missouri, this is different. And another case coming out of the Eighth Circuit comes from Arkansas. And here the requirement at issue, not exactly the same as an admitting privileges requirement, but it's very similar. It basically says that instead of the abortion provider having admitting privileges, they have to have a contract with a doctor who has admitting privileges. So it's kind of a backup doctor requirement. And in Arkansas, the district court made some very lengthy and specific findings including about how safe abortion is, including specifically in that state, um, made findings about the impact of the requirement on the ground, how it would shut down two out of the three providers in the state if the requirement takes effect. And after all of that, the district court decided that this requirement was unconstitutional. But again, the Eighth Circuit reversed. And the Eighth Circuit said this time, that the district court was wrong because it didn't estimate the number of women who would be burdened by the requirement. And this, this estimate, this estimate requirement is definitely not something the Supreme Court had ever required when it struck down abortion restrictions. But the Eighth Circuit decided to tack it on to the undue burden standard. So these are just a couple of, exam of examples of ways that the more conservative courts have interpreted away what should have been a major win for abortion providers. And now the Supreme Court has another abortion case in front of it, so which Joel will talk about. Um, so we'll see where we go from here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mai, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, I'm Joel Dodge. I'm a staff attorney with the Center for Reproductive Rights. Uh, I specialize in judicial strategy work. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit about the center, we're a global legal advocacy organization uh, dedicated to advancing reproductive rights as fundamental human rights. Um, we do that around the globe and in the United States. And 
as my mentioned on March 4th of uh, this year, we will be back at the Supreme Court for oral arguments in June Medical Services versus Gee. Uh, it's a challenge brought by the center to a Louisiana law that would shut down almost every abortion clinic in the state if it takes effect. The Louisiana law at issue is an admitting privileges law and it's identical to the Texas law that the Supreme Court already struck down in Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstedt as, as, May, as May spoke about earlier. Uh, this admitting privileges law forbids doctors from providing abortion care if they do not have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital. Uh, those admitting privileges are nearly impossible for abortion providers to obtain in Louisiana, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, the hospitals can deny admitting privileges for any reason at all. It's entirely up to their discretion. And hospitals frequently deny admitting privileges to abortion providers because they are afraid of backlash, they don't want to stoke controversy or ideological opposition, um, and also because patients rarely ever need to be admitted uh, for follow-up care after an abortion. In fact, the law serves no medical purpose at all precisely because abortion is such a safe procedure. So putting this unnecessary regulatory burden on doctors is really just a backdoor way of trying to close clinics entirely. If the law takes effect, it would leave just one doctor at a single clinic to provide abortion care for nearly one million women of reproductive age in Louisiana, um, a feat that would be nearly and entirely impossible to actually undertake. And the thing about these laws, it's important to recognize that they reliably hurt the most marginalized and vulnerable individuals and communities the most. Um, Low-income people, people living in poverty, people of color, immigrants, young people, and rural communities are always the most affected um, by these kinds of trap laws because laws that shut down clinics and force people to travel farther just to see a doctor, those can be really insurmountable hurdles if you have to take time off from your hourly job and lose pay, or if you don't have access to a car, public transportation, or if it's really hard to afford a uh, hotel or childcare. Um, so these laws can be real hurdles and in some case, almost absolute barriers uh, for many people in these positions. And despite the Supreme Court's ruling in Whole Woman's Health, Louisiana did continue to defend its admitting privileges law in court, even though it is identical to the law that the Supreme Court has struck down in Texas. Um, in fact, Louisiana lawmakers modeled their law on Texas's law after recognizing its, uh, quote, tremendous success in closing clinics there. Uh, so the Louisiana law was explicitly a carbon copy of what was done in Texas in an attempt to replicate uh, the success of Texas's law in closing clinics. In 2017, uh, you have on the timeline in front of you, a uh, federal district court struck down Louisiana's admitting privileges law, recognizing that this is a settled issue, that whole women's health controlled the outcome, and that these types of laws are unconstitutional. Um, but Louisiana appealed, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed and actually upheld the admitting privileges law in spite of whole women's health. That decision was based on uh, the types of geographical differences between Texas and Louisiana, a uh, similar logic and reasoning that um, Mai talked about earlier from some of these hostile circuit courts of appeals. Um, the Fifth Circuit also suggested and, and said that Louisiana doctors did not make sufficient efforts to comply with the admitting privileges law, um, that the doctors didn't do enough to actually show that they were burdened by the law. Um, but in doing that, the Fifth Circuit stepped outside of the typical role for an appellate court and overrode the district court's own findings of fact to the contrary, finding that the doctors put in plenty of efforts, in fact, did make a good faith effort to comply, um, but the Fifth Circuit reversed that anyway. Um, after that decision, the center asked the entire Fifth Circuit to rehear the case on Bonk. Uh, they declined to do so on a nine to six vote um, the dissenting judge on the Fifth Circuit, Judge Dennis, wrote 
in his dissent that the panel majority opinion is in clear conflict with the Supreme Court's decision in Holman's Health holding unconstitutional and almost identical Texas admitting privileges requirement that served as a model for Act 620. Um, so some judges on the Fifth Circuit did, did get it that this was an, an easy case. This was a carbon copy of the law that had been struck down in Holman's Health. So we applied and won an emergency stay from the Supreme Court uh, to keep Louisiana's clinics open while we filed a petition for cert. Um, that stay application was a five to four vote at the Supreme Court with Chief Justice Roberts joining the majority uh, with the four more liberal justices on the court, um, which kept the law from going into effect and kept Louisiana's clinics open for the time being. Uh, so we filed our cert petition, and in October, the Supreme Court granted that petition and agreed to hear the case on the merits. Um, this will be the first abortion case since Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh joined the court. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, of course, replaced Justice Kennedy, who provided the decisive fifth vote in our favor in Whole Woman's Health in 2016. Uh, beyond the, the merits, of this case, there is even more at stake. Uh, the Supreme Court also granted a cross petition by Louisiana asking the court to reconsider 50 year old precedent granting third party standing to abortion providers so they can go to court on behalf of their patients. Uh, if the Supreme Court took Louisiana's invitation and upended that precedent, and doctors can't fight for their patients' rights, many abortion cases would never even make it to court at all. Um, so that's an, a lurking issue in this case that's really dangerous and that um, deserves more attention than it's, it's getting. Um, it's a serious issue that the court has taken up uh, after Louisiana asked them to do so. Briefing is now complete at the Supreme Court. Uh, in addition to the party's briefs, we had overwhelming amicus support from nearly 200 organizations, more than 700 individuals representing leading voices in medicine and law, and public policy and advocacy, along with people who have actually exercised their right to abortion, speaking uh, really personally about the impact of abortion restrictions and what having access to abortion meant in their lives. Uh, one of these amicus briefs was a brief from the American Bar Association, as Betsy mentioned at the top. Um, that brief warned of the risks to the rule of law and the Constitution if the Supreme Court backtracks from its own precedent in this case. This is uh, a landmark brief. It's the first time the ABA has submitted a brief in a case dealing with reproductive health care. Um, we also had briefs representing hundreds of women who have exercised their rights to abort, their right to abortion, including veterans and medical school students. Um, there's one brief signed by uh, over 360 attorneys speaking about their own abortion stories and the importance of that access in their lives and careers. Uh, the other side, Louisiana had amicus support too, including a brief signed by 207 uh, members of Congress urging the court to quote, take up the issue of whether Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey should be reconsidered and if appropriate, overruled. So those are members of Congress, a substantial number urging the court to think about reconsidering the core precedent establishing the right to abortion in the United States. Assuming the court turns down uh, that offer and faithfully applies its own precedent, uh, June Medical should be a very straightforward decision. Uh, a law that was unconstitutional in Texas, not even four years ago, must be unconstitutional in neighboring Louisiana today. Nothing has changed that could justify a different outcome. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Floyd to discuss the medical perspective around reproductive health. Thank you, uh, Joel. And now you, thank you. <laughs> So I do have a few uh, slides for the first part of my section, just because uh, I'm going to go over some basic information uh, about abortion care since uh, the underlying knowledge foundation for members who are participating in the webinar, I know, is, is quite varied. So just to kind of get us started, and next slide. Uh, 
general information to know is that 18% of pregnancies, and this is data from 2017, ended in abortion. So that's a pretty significant proportion, um, which equates to about one in four women over time having an abortion by the time they're age 45. Um, so again, one in four is a pretty significant uh, number of uh, individuals in our society who will require this care. Next slide. Uh, why abortion is so common is because pregnancies that are unintended, mistimed, unwanted are common. About 45% of the pregnancies that occur, occur either at a time when a pregnancy was not planned for or occur at a time um, for an individual who never intended to have a pregnancy. And so um, they opt to, to not carry that pregnancy forward. So it's a, a very personal choice that a lot of women have to make. And it's a very common choice that's made uh, frequently. Next slide. So of the unintended pregnancies that occur, uh, about 58% of them do end in live birth, but about half of them, about 42%, um, end in abortion. So for those, uh, when you think about about half the pregnancies are unintended, about half of those pregnancies that are unintended um, end in abortion care. Next slide. Despite that frequency though, we do know that abor abortion rates overall, overall are declining. So between 2011 and between 2017, there was about a 90% decline in the number of abortions occurring nationwide. Next slide. This data that, uh, this slide that is uh, from the Guttmacher Institute shows that the a uh, trend with abortion care hit a peak at about 1981 after the passage of Roe v. Wade in 1973, and pretty much since then has had a steady decline, reaching an all-time low um, to where we, we see the number of 13.5 in 2017. Next slide. So the questions are, uh, you know, one of the main questions that, that comes up often is why is that? Why are we seeing this steady um, inconsistent decline? And those who are anti-choice and who are pushing legislation that promotes restrictions on abortion care would like to be able to claim um, that it's because of these restrictions. But in actuality, they're probably not the main driver. Um, what they do is that they significantly reduce individual access. And that occurs because these restrictions lead to closure of clinics that not only provide abortion care, but provide a lot of other very necessary uh, healthcare services, particularly to individuals who um, may not have access to these services through any other avenue. Between 2011 and 2017, 32 states enacted 394 new restrictions. Um, and what that translated into is a decrease in uh, clinics nationwide of about 4%. So the greatest, uh, uh, greatest amount of decline happened in the South, which you can see there in that decline of 50 clinics, 25 of which were in Texas alone. So half of the clinics that closed in the South happened in one state. Um, in the Midwest, the net decline was about 33 clinics. And in the West, a net decline of about seven clinics. Um, interestingly, and fortunately, in the Northeast, we saw an opposite trend where they actually had a net increase of, in clinics of about 59. Next slide. So why uh, are some other thought, or what are some other thoughts behind why we've seen a decline in the abortion rate? Well, it's probably also related to the fact that there's a decline in births and pregnancies overall. And there are a lot of theories as to why that may be, um, some of which you see listed on here. So contraceptive access and use. With the Affordable Care Act and with coverage of uh, contraceptive uh, services by various private insurance plans, it increased and expanded access to patients who previously did not have the ability to obtain the contraceptive method that they, uh, that they desired. And then add to that, Medicaid expansion in the states that chose to expand also allowed um, uh, insurance coverage for individuals who previously did not have insurance and hence uh, previously were not able to um, afford the contraceptive method that they desired. Um, there's also been a theory postulated about a decrease in sexual activity that has potentially resulted in decrease in, uh, in pregnancies and births overall. Uh, infertility is another possibility. We know that uh, childbearing has been uh, progressively delayed over time for multiple different reasons and with an increase in age uh, comes uh, an increase in the, the so I should, sorry, a decrease in the ability to be able to become pregnant, um, as well as increases in, in complications of pregnancy, including loss. So infertility, which may, you know, is obviously completely unrelated to, uh, to the legislative scene, can potentially account for some of these declines. And then there's also the, um, the matter of self-managed abortion, which is not a large percentage of why we might be seeing the decline that we've seen in abortion care. However, it is an option that uh, more individuals are turning to for various reasons, access being one of them, but some of them just being that they want to be able to take control 
um, of their abortion care into their own hands, and so they're they're choosing to do that. Next slide. So a little bit of information about who has abortions, because there's a lot of conversation and a lot of uh, rhetoric, even uh, and, and and stereotyping around who uh, you know what the average abortion patient looks like. Next slide. So this is another uh, infograph from the Guttmacher Institute that kind of puts out the demographics of, of the majority of the individuals who seek abortion care. We know that about 75% are poor or low income, and the majority of the individuals seeking abortion care are uh, uh, individuals of color. So you see in the race category there, 39% were white, but 28% were black, 25% Hispanic, 6% Asian Pacific Islander, and 3% other. Uh, religion, so contrary to what uh, many people may think, 62% of those who seek abortion care do have a re religious affiliation. Um, also, uh, contrary to what some may, uh, the, the image or perception some may have of individuals who seek abortion care, 59% already have a child. And interestingly, about half of the individuals who uh, seek abortion care were trying, you know, were using a contraceptive method at the time that they uh, became pregnant. When we look at age, 60% are in their 20s. Um, again, uh, unlike what the typical image is of an individual seeking abortion care, only 12% are teens, of which 4% are minors. So when you look at this information, it, it, it again drives home the point that was made earlier, that when these restrictions occur, and as a result of these restrictions, individual access is affected um, through clinic closures, the populations that are being most affected by that are the populations who are um, represented on the side, the folks who actually are already marginalized and having a, a very difficult time accessing the care that they need, and this only makes it that much harder for them. Next slide. So when are abortions occurring? When in pregnancy are, uh, do most abortions occur? Next slide. Uh, so we know that about almost 90% of pregnancies occur in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy with about two thirds of those occurring, two thirds of abortions overall occurring at eight weeks of pregnancy or earlier. When you look at the percentage of pregnancies that occur, I'm sorry, the percent, percentage of abortions that occur later in uh, pregnancy, uh, only about 5% occur over 16 weeks and 1.3% occur um, in pregnancies that are over 21 weeks. So again, a lot of the image that's put out there and a lot of the rhetoric makes it seem like abortions are occurring very late in pregnancy and uh, making it seem like this is a terrible procedure that's, you know, um, that's occurring with um, pregnancies that otherwise could be carried to term um, because they're already close to being at term. But in reality, the vast majority occur extremely early in a pregnancy. So it's very different than, than the picture that's painted. Next slide. When we do see abortions that occur after 16 weeks, the reasons why they occur, you can see some of the percentage, you know, what, um, what's listed here is some of the, the reasons and, and how often those reasons are the reasons why the, the abortion was delayed. Um, about, and this is data that is a little old. So I will say that this is, uh, data from 1987. I think these numbers will look very, very different if you were to ask these same questions in this day and age, because in particular, when you see um, the category had difficulty making arrangements for abortion um, with restrictions in place and issues that we see, such as waiting periods, um, uh, mandatory counseling, ultrasound requirements, these are things that make it that much more difficult for a patient to get in to get the care that they need. Um, and so that number 48% is probably actually a lot higher now than it was when this survey was originally done. Um, but the top most four, for the, the top four that you see there um, are that they did not recognize a pregnancy, and sometimes it's just that that patients there's a delay in recognizing because of symptoms that they may have or may not be having um, that that lead them to think that they are not pregnant when in act, and in fact they are, and by the time they realize it, they're later in their pregnancy. I'm um, having difficulty making arrangements. I already mentioned some of the struggles that occur there is the fact that often patients are having to take time off of work. They're having to arrange transportation because um, the vast number of counties in this country don't have abortion providers. So they're having to be able to make arrangements to get to the nearest uh, provider. Um, they're having to uh, arrange childcare. So there's a lot of different personal factors. Um, not having the um, the, the money to be able to uh, cover the cost of an abortion. And then generally, the later you get in a pregnancy, the cost tends to increase. Uh, and so they're, you know, as they're waiting to try to get the money that they need, they're getting further along, which is then increasing the cost and making it that much more of a struggle. So there are a lot of reasons why the, there's that difficulty. And then when you add to it, things like waiting periods, which then mean that uh, what could have been done in a single visit is now having to be done 
and two, sometimes three or even four visits, um, then it makes it really, really difficult. Uh, next slide. So uh, to transition a little bit into just talking about, about abortion itself, I wanted to just give a very quick overview of what we're talking about when we say abortion care. Um, there's really two different uh, categories of abortion care that patients seek. One is medication abortion and the other is in-clinic abortion or what people sometimes traditionally call surgical. Next slide. Um, so uh, surgical abortion, I'll kind of take a step back. This is talking about the overall safety of surgical abortion specifically. Uh, a really, really important point again to stress, which has been mentioned previously, is that abortion is very, very safe. When you look at the abortion related uh, mortality rate, um, the numbers are very, very low and significantly lower than what it is to carry a pregnancy to term. The complications most commonly um, are, uh, the most common complications are the ones that you see listed there. But again, when you look at those percentages of how often those things happen, it's very, very rare. Um, surgical abortion, when it's performed, generally in the first trimester, um, involves a, a procedure that can be done in an office setting. Um, it can be done in, uh, in a procedure room. Um, sometimes it can be done in surgical centers, but by no means is, is it a requirement for them to be done in, in a surgical center. The same place where a woman might go to get her annual exam and her pap smear, that same exact office could accommodate um, an in-clinic abortion in the first trimester. Uh, they can be done as early as five weeks. Uh, they can be completed in a single visit. So again, coming in and, and having everything done from start to finish in that same visit uh, is completely safe. And it actually what occurs in a lot of states that have friendly uh, legislation that allows for that. Uh, abortion in the second trimester can tend to be a little bit more involved and, and uh, can be done in one visit depending on uh, how far along in the pregnancy an individual is, uh, or sometimes it may be required to be done over the course of two visits because there's an element of preparing the cervix for the actual procedure itself. Uh, so, but again, second trimester procedures are also very, very safe uh, and can be done in an outpatient setting, again, depending on what gestational age you're talking about. And, uh, and then in addition to the dilation and evacuation procedure that can be done, there is also an option for labor induction, which can be done in specific settings where there may be patient desires um, that, um, that dictate the procedure be done that way. Next slide. Uh, and then there's medication abortion. So medication abortion really is a patient taking pills and going through a process that's similar to a miscarriage. It's uh, they pass the pregnancy in the privacy of their own home. Um, it's extremely safe and for some patients definitely preferable to having to have a procedure performed uh, in an office setting. There are two medications that are primarily used. There are several medications that can be used, but the, the most common um, and most effective regimen involves taking medi the medications mifepristone and mesoprostol. Mifepristone is often administered in an office setting because uh, due to FDA regulations and requirements, it cannot be excuse me, provided through a prescription and picked up at a pharmacy. So individuals have to go through a process to be able to dispense mifepristone. So patients often uh, are given the medication to take in an office setting, and then they're given a prescription for, um, or given the actual pills of mesoprostol, which they take at a certain amount of time later. Um, they have options for different routes that they can take the mesoprostol, whether they place it um, in the vagina or they end up taking it by mouth. Um, and how long after taking the mifepristone they take the mesoprostol will depend on the route that they choose to, um, to go with the second set of pills. This, this option can be taken as early as four weeks um, and is generally used up uh, to the gestational age of 70 days. It does often require some type of way to confirm that there's been completion. So whether that's coming back in for an appointment to have an ultrasound versus having blood work drawn either in an office setting or at a lab um, with a, you know, with a series of questions to, to help assess whether or not there's been complete passage. Um, it does require some, some type of follow-up, but the follow-up does not always require a patient to come back into the office. And it is very effective. The, route, the regimen that the majority of providers use that, that uh, use mifepristone and mesoprostol has a 95 to 99% efficacy. Next slide. So I'm gonna transition a little bit uh, away from talking about just abortion in general and speak from the perspective of a provider who's able to provide care in a friendly environment. Um, next slide. 
And this is just kind of a placeholder slide um, as I am going to just kind of talk about uh, my experiences. So uh, I am the medical director at the Planned Parenthood of Metropolitan Washington, D.C., which is an affiliate that has health centers in Washington, D.C. and in Maryland. But we service patients that are uh, also uh, residents of Northern Virginia. So it's kind of the, the DMV area um, is our catchment area. So it's interesting because I have a little bit of a perspective from the friendly as well as the unfriendly because I practice in two areas, the DC in DC and in Maryland, uh, which are friendly, and then Virginia, which uh, has not been, but we are hoping will become with um, changes from the last election. So uh, when I think about practicing medicine, uh, practicing abortion care in DC, first and foremost, I think it's important to highlight that just yesterday on the anniversary of Roe, we had passage in the district of the Strengthening Reproductive Health Protections Amendment Act, Amendment Act, which was a very, very important act, which did several things, one of which was to pr protect abortion access in DC, um, should we lose Roe, but then also importantly, um, uh, had provisions that would protect healthcare professionals who participate in abortion care, uh, so that those individuals would not be able to be discriminated against uh, when they are in their current employment or when they're seeking uh, other positions. So this uh, was a huge win for us because DC did not have anything on the books previously that would have protected the district and, and its uh, residents should uh, rule uh, fall, but now we do. So that in of itself kind of gives an, an illustration of practicing in a friendly area. We have legislators who definitely work with us to make sure that their constituents and my patients um, receive the care that they need when it comes to abortion. Uh, when I also think about restrictions that are, are happening all over the country, including our neighboring state of Virginia, I think about, again, the ease with which I'm able to see a patient when they come in uh, for their, you know, their full visit in one day. So DC does not have uh, any mandatory waiting periods. DC does not have restrictions on, I'm sorry, uh, does not require mandatory ultrasounds. There's no mandated counseling, which means that we often have patients who travel to us from Virginia where there are waiting, where there is a waiting period um, and required ultrasound. Uh, they come here to be able to get their care because again, they can just do it in one day. There are no restrictions uh, on minors receiving care. So unlike in Virginia where there is a requirement for parental consent, and even in Maryland, there is a requirement for parental notification, slightly different. Um, but here in DC, there's no requirement for either. So again, what we often see are patients or uh, minors who may travel to us because they don't have to deal with the restrictions um, in the state in which they reside. We don't have gestational age bans um, or method bans, so some of the other issues that you see in other places. So our affiliate does procedures um, up to about uh, 20 weeks and six days, but we have other um, practices uh, and abortion providers in the district who go further in gestational age. So we, again, often see patients that travel from far distances um, from states where there are limits uh, in gestational age that um, can come here to be able to get the care that they need uh, for whatever reason they are needing to, to end their pregnancy. So uh, practicing in DC again has a lot of benefits and Maryland is very similar. So I have to say a lot of the things I mentioned before, Maryland does not have those restrictions either. The only slight difference is just that, that in Maryland there is a, a notification requirement for minors, but fortunately there is a, a physician bypass to that. So uh, if a physician you know, judges in their professional opinion that a minor is able to make the decision to have an abortion, they can go ahead and grant that abortion without the parental notification uh, needing to occur. And um, the other uh, great benefit to Maryland is that I think uh, for those individuals who are familiar with the Hyde Amendment, which restricts federal funding for um, abortion care, uh, a lot of states that, that primarily use federal funding for their Medicaid programs, what that means is that those patients are not able to use their Medicaid insurance to pay for their abortion care, which is what happens in, in Virginia and also unfortunately in the district. But Maryland has opted to use its own state funds to be able to cover abortion care. So Maryland Medicaid does help pay for patients' abortions, which is a, a huge benefit. And we often see patients um, in the district as well, because we take Maryland Medicaid here as well, who, uh, who are able to use their, their, their uh, Medicaid insurance to cover their abortions who otherwise might not have been able to, uh, to afford them. So I think I'm going to wrap up my section really just with a, uh, you know, a couple patient stories that drive it home. Because obviously showing the numbers is, is one thing and kind of looking at the stats. Um, but when you hear what it actually means to an individual who uh, is really, really, truly relying on this care, sometimes for life-saving reasons, it, it's, um, the impact is greater. I saw a patient uh, about a month ago who was a, an individual who 
was in was not in a relationship but was trying to leave a relationship with a partner who was extremely violent um, she had actually obtained a restraining order against this individual last summer, but was afraid to contact the police whenever he violated it because he had already threatened on multiple occasions that he would kill her um, if she did so. So because of, of her fear, she never called the cops. So he continued um, to show up at her job, um, to call her, to text her, to threaten her, to threaten her mother. Uh, and then he would also show up and force her to have sex. So as a result of one of these episodes of rape, she became pregnant. She came into our health center here in DC, and uh, fortunately, she she was a Maryland Medicaid. And fortunately, because she had her Maryland Medicaid, um, she we were able to use her insurance to uh, cover her um, her abortion procedure. And for this patient who was in the midst of trying to figure out what her next steps were going to be, she already had a child who was two years old. Um, she was staying with friends, again, trying to figure out how to get away from this violent partner. And the idea of having, you know, a two-year-old and then having another pregnancy, and she wasn't working at the time, was essentially homeless because she didn't have anywhere to live. So trying to figure out how to take care of two children in that situation was just impossible. So she came in to see us. We were able um, to do her procedure. And um, at the end of that visit, she hugged everyone in the health center, you know, and was crying because she just was so excited about the fact that, okay, now she could really start to focus on herself and her daughter and on rebuilding their lives and trying to get out of the situation, which um, ultimately um, may lead to her leaving the area. But whatever she decides she needs to do, um, having the abortion was going to really help her to, to start that path. And then a last story that I want um, to share is of a patient who I took care of who was um, a political prisoner, someone who was from um, West Africa, who, while she was held as a political prisoner, um, went through terrible, terrible things that were done to her. Um, so she was able to flee and was able to escape, um, was able uh, to uh, meet up with her three children and her sister. But in the course of trying to escape, they got separated. And so she left her three children and her sister um, because she knew that if she was captured again, she would be killed. So she decided to separate from them and ended up getting uh, somehow to South America and then was able to try to work her way up um, into the US. But in, on her way coming up through to the US, um, again, suffered some terrible traumas, including a rape that resulted in a pregnancy. So she lost everything as she was trying to make her way to the States. Um, somehow through the graces was able to get to, um, to DC here and came into our health center to, um, to be uh, taken care of. And for this patient who at the time when I saw her still had had no contact with her three children or her sister, um, really all she had with her was the clothing that she had on her back and the shoes that she had on her feet and a small shopping bag with a tiny, a small jacket. And this was in winter. Um, so for this individual who really had nothing um, and who was pregnant, it was trying to figure out how she was going to start her life all over again, being able to access that abortion care was crucial because she had nothing. I mean, she had nothing. and this pregnancy that resulted from an assault um, was something that she absolutely felt, you know, I she had to end that pregnancy to be able to, tar to, tar to start to um, take steps in the direction to try to rebuild something of a normal life back. So when I, um, you know, as a provider who sees patients like these, who hears these stories, who knows firsthand what it is like for these individuals when they don't have the access to the care that they need, um, it really, really, um, inspires in me a very strong desire to want to push and fight um, and to provide that perspective and to you know provide these stories and give these narratives so that people really understand um, what these laws mean at the the very um, very personal level um, so at this point I'm going to turn over to my colleague Dr. Colleen McNicholas who's going to talk a little bit about what it's like to practice in an unfriendly state Thanks, Serena, and to everybody who's already presented. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that most of those of you who are listening are lawyers. And I will tell you, when I went to medical school, I never knew how many lawyers I would have in my life. So um, thank you to all of you uh, for the work that you do, because certainly um, as Serena has shared and my, as well as Joel, um, the, the work of securing abortion access for folks across the country um, is really a team sport um, and you all are integral to that, um, to that sport. So thank you for your work. Okay, next slide. 
Um, I have one and only slide, um, and this is it. So um, every potential restriction that um, Serena had mentioned, not having, we have. Um, Missouri is uh, the perfect example of sort of what can happen when the most extreme um, tactics are employed to end abortion in a state. And, and I say that um, sort of in some ways we are similar to other states um, in admitting privilege laws and ambulatory surgical requirements. You've heard a little bit about how um, after Whole Women's Health, Missouri had a tiny little story of success um, uh, only ultimately to be undone um, sort of higher in the courts. But, but that story in and of itself, actually, I'm going to fill out a little bit more to really demonstrate what it is like to practice um, in a state like Missouri. While that case was being litigated, our legislatures, who um, I will say are amongst the most extreme, but like in other restrictive states, do not reflect what the population in Missouri believes. Missouri is like every other state across the country um, in terms of the folks who live here um, and work here believing in and supporting access to abortion care. Um, unfortunately, we, like many other states um, who are navigating really restrictive legislators, um, are having to do the hard work of getting those people engaged and making sure that they know that when they are hitting or not hitting that ballot box, that it, it does make a real difference um, down the road. So as my head said, you know, after Whole Women's Health Missouri did challenge our admitting privileges and our um, ambulatory surgical requirements. And um, and it was, I think, because the legislature believed that we had every right and that we would be successful in that challenge, um, they immediately started working on another tactic to employ those same sort of requirements. And so they took what they normally use in the legislative process and they just relocated it to the regulatory process and put it really in the hands of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so it really just gave them a whole nother vehicle uh, to employ both of those regulations as well as many more. And that I think is the real story of Missouri is that they have not only used the, the traditional legislative process, and yes, we have one of the most aggressive and craziest abortion bans um, that was passed last year with um, some escalating gestational language. So we start at eight weeks and if eight weeks is unconstitutional, then hey, we'll go to 14. And if that's found unconstitutional, then we'll go to 18. Um, as well as incorporating things like prison time for physicians who provide abortion, um, changes in malpractice requirements. It's a whole host of things, but those are things that I think other states are also um, facing and challenging and fighting. But Aside from that sort of traditional legislative approach, um, we really saw this last year, a doubling down on the regulatory approach. approach. And um, like many of my restrictive state colleagues, our Planned Parenthood facility does face annual inspections every year. And I will say, so long as I've been alive, uh, this facility has passed those restrictions, of, or those inspections, excuse me, um, every year without issue um, until this year. And what we really saw this year was, um, not just regulation under the what used to be sort of veiled attempt to pretend like it was for the health and well-being of of patients, but really just an outright um, uh, very forward attack on um, the care that we we were providing and really changing the regulatory and inspection process in a way that made it impossible for us to comply. And what I mean by that is truly from day to day, the interpretation of regulations was changed. So they were in the health center on Monday and said we had to do it this way. And then when they came back a week later, we were doing it wrong and now we needed to do it a different way. Clearly that is just an untenable situation in which we can't, um, we will never be able to comply when the, when the interpretation is always changing. The other really important change that we saw this year was um, requiring, uh, requiring us to do things that they know really push the bounds of our medical ethics. Um, and so in doing that, pushing us to a place where we were now gonna have to decide, were we gonna stick to our ethical principle uh, in the, the way that we're delivering care, or are we gonna bend on that just so we can continue to secure our license? Um, and the example I'll use, um, to sort of demonstrate this is probably one that many have watched unfold um, in the in the public narrative, and that was the requirement for us to do multiple pelvic exams for patients. Um, the state of Missouri was telling us that we had to do um, a pelvic exam 
on the first day. So if you remember Serena saying that they didn't have any waiting periods, um, we have a set mandated 72 hour waiting period um, in which an individual who's seeking abortion must come to us at least 72 hours and must be consented by the same physician who will ultimately do their procedure. And so the reality um, of this regulation, and the truth is the reality for patients is a consequence of the totality of all of the restrictions, um, is that for often, for, for many of them, it's often many, many, many days from the time they get their consent into the time they have their abortion. With only one, one um, place to have an abortion in Missouri, uh, we have people traveling hundreds of miles, navigating days off of work and childcare and all of those sort of social and logistic aspects. Um, and so getting back within those that 72 hours is, is oftentimes impossible for, for folks. So the state said that we were gonna, we were now required to do a public exam on that day, as well as when it was medically appropriate, um, just prior to their procedure. Um, and we really faced a what we felt like was an impossible decision. We knew that um, in that moment, if we decided that we were not going to comply, that they would that would be essentially a ticket for them to say we weren't going to renew your license, and Missouri would immediately cease to have any access to abortion. And so, um, for a short time, we did try to comply with that um, with that new regulation. Uh, I will tell you, this is a regulation that had been on the books for longer than I have been alive, um, and this was the first time that they ever interpreted in this fashion. Um, in doing so, um, we I saw sort of trauma unfold on levels that are really sort of um, undescribable, both for patients and for providers. Um, one of the very first patients that we saw um, under this new compliance was a minor accompanied by her mother, um, who also was a, a victim of sexual assault, um, who had never had a pelvic exam and walked into our clinic with a teddy bear. And so um, what should have been a, um, a straightforward just education and ultrasound on her tummy turned into a really traumatic experience for her and for the provider, particularly because there was no real medical relevant reason to provide that exam. So it took just a few days for our clinicians um, and our patients to, to basically tell us that, you know, we weren't gonna do this. And so we decided that um, although the reality might be that they take away our license, that that was a line that we were no longer gonna step over and that we felt like our patients trusted us um, to provide them care that was evidence-based, consistent with what we knew what was best for them and that that's what we were gonna do regardless. Um, and so with the help of our friends from MSNBC and Rachel Maddow, um, our decision to, um, to not force patients to have unnecessary pelvic exams really took off and, and then sort of um, tumbled into this wider narrative around what's going on in restrictive states and, and across the country. Um, we are currently still fighting for our license um, and have been through a variety of different uh, litigation processes and are sort of awaiting um, a decision from our administrative hearing courts here in March. Um, but beyond that, um, our specific experience this year in Missouri has also now resulted in some national attention. And um, I had the honor and privilege of um, testifying um, in front of a congressional hearing. I can now say it was an honor and privilege. It was not quite that in the beginning before we did it. <laughs> um, but now all said and done, um, I had the honor and privilege of, of um, testifying about the Missouri experience and what really is at stake when we allow states to so erode um, access to reproductive health care that we are, you know, that abortion um, access is hanging by a thread. I was joined in that um, congressional hearing by a patient of ours, a former patient of ours, who shared her abortion story, as well as some other folks who talked about really the injustice of not being able to have access to abortion. Um, I think, you know, as has been stated before, I think both by my and Joel, I think the consequence of a Supreme Court decision this time that differs from our very recent decision in Whole Woman's Health is that states like Missouri will most certainly feel emboldened to continue to um, no longer sort of take the chip away approach, which I think is what we had previously said, but really just to sort of all out um, attempt to ban abortion in the state. Um, it is certainly difficult at times to provide care in a place like Missouri, but it is also one of the most rewarding um, experiences that I think that I have had. Um, whether it is legal or not, we know that abortion 
will remain a reality for people across the country. And, um, you know, my commitment when I became a physician, um, and certainly Serena will uh, attest to this, I think, was that we are going to provide the care in the safest way that we can for patients. And that's, and that's what Missouri is hopefully demonstrated is willing to do and will continue to do. So thank you for the opportunity to share sort of the trials and tribulations of Missouri and stay tuned because the drama continues. <laughs> Colleen, thank you so much for that. And thank you to Serena and to Joel and to Mai. Thank you everybody for these presentations. They were um, absolutely fascinating, informative. And I wanna say that we also have been getting some questions in and included in the questions are also thanks from uh, folks who are in the audience for uh, taking your time, sharing your expertise, sharing your experiences, and specifically for sharing your personal stories. Um, so I would like to encourage folks to use the question box to type in a question if you have one, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. I'm gonna start with a couple of the questions that have actually come in, um, and then we have some other questions I definitely wanna pose um, to all of the panelists um, in light of these great presentations. Um, the first question that has come in um, is uh, uh, for Dr. Floyd. Um, Dr. Floyd, there's a question about when you were talking about self-managed abortion, um, perhaps being one of the reasons accounting for the decline in abortion rates. And the question is specifically, does that mean that the data that's being collected right now showing the, de the decline in abortion is only tracking abortions happening in medical systems and self-managed abortions are not included in the data? And can you speak to that sort of in general? Yeah, so I think the first thing to to mention is that I don't think that the decline is is being significantly contributed to by self-managed abortion. I think there, you know, as I go through a list of things that people think about, um, that's on that list, but I don't think it's a major contributor to that decline. Um, I think the other thing is is to you know to be aware of is is how the data is collected that even determines the number of abortions that are happening. Um, it's there's through, it's through different reporting requirements that that vary from kind of state to state, um, and how even you know clinics uh, do that. There is no real way to capture reliable data on self-managed abortion, right? Because these are individuals who are often um, getting information from the internet or from some other source, um, obtaining their medications through various means, but they're not obtaining their medications or you know, going through the process in a reportable manner. So we really don't have a true sense, which is part of the reason why we, we ideally, I mean, while we don't really have a, a great idea how much of um, the self-managed abortion care is contributing to the decline, but, um, or the, the appearance of the decline, um, but it, um, it is, uh, you know, it's just a harder thing to try to track and to try to monitor because it's, it's people kind of at home on the internet ordering things. Um, and, uh, and even the numbers that we have about abortion data, again, probably may also be somewhat of an underrepresentation because it really relies on providers and clinics to report. And depending on what the systems are, what the requirements are, where they're located, um, that data may or may not be, you know, fully accurate. Thank you for that. And I hope um, for the person who asked the question that that answers your question. Thanks, Dr. Floyd. Um, one question I'd like to pose to the whole group and perhaps for ease, since we're all in different offices in different cities, um, uh, we'll go in the order of presentations um, from Mai to Joel, um, to Serena to Colleen. Um, there are tons of myths out there, significant myths when it comes to access to abortion, access to reproductive health care, abortion, the laws, everything. Um, what, from your perspective, are some of the most significant myths and uh, how can we all help to debunk them? And Maya, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks, Betsy. So I don't know if this is really a myth, but I think sometimes when we talk about reproductive access generally and, and access to abortion, uh, our focus is too narrow and we're thinking about the number of providers or the number of health centers in a community. But I think there needs to be a better recognition that there are other barriers um, to patients accessing care, no matter who their closest or where their closest provider is. And, um, you know, reproductive justice organizations have been doing the hard work of recognizing and uplifting those barriers. So organizations like Sister Song and the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, they've been, they've recognized that you know, people don't live single issue lives. Um, there are lots of policies, um, other laws like immigration policies 
there are factors like how to parent with dignity, how to parent in a safe community. All of that needs to be talked about when we talk about reproductive access generally. So I think that's something that needs more focus. Um, I'd say from a legal perspective, one of the biggest myths out there is that the right to abortion in reality hinges on Roe v. Wade um, remaining good law. Like there's a sense that unless Roe is overruled, that the abortion care is safe in the United States. And that's just not the case, as we heard from Dr. McNicholas in particular. Um, the amount of damage that hostile state politicians can do, even with Roe on the books. You know, we've got six states that are down to their last abortion clinic, even with Roe as the law of the land. Um, and, and so Roe can really be eroded without being formally overruled uh, if the Supreme Court wants it to be, and if um, hostile states are determined to do that. Uh, they can really turn the right to abortion into something that exists in theory more than in fact. Um, and so I think it's important to communicate both to lawyers and non-lawyers alike that um, it's not just about whether a Supreme Court decision says Roe v. Wade is hereby overruled, um, but that Roe can be the law of the land and states can still throw up hurdles and obstacles and clinic shutdown laws that accomplish much the same. So it requires even more vigilance um, than just paying attention to the you know, latest Supreme Court case. Um, I think to, to kind of add a little bit even more to what Joel was just saying, uh, you know, for years now, even before all of the, the myriad of restrictions came uh, came through, the fact that abortion was legal really did not mean a lot to a lot of communities where they still did not have access which you know regardless of what the state legislation was trying to do um they just by virtue of certain communities particularly communities of color um immigrant communities lgbtq plus communities um you know individuals with limited resources you know there are groups that even though even before the kind of storm that has that we've seen over the past few years there are groups where in the face of, of uh, a legal access, uh, a legal right to abortion, there really wasn't a right to abortion because there was no access for uh, for many other reasons. And so I think that's something important to note because I think again that myth of oh if it's legal all of a sudden everybody can have it and that's not that that hasn't been the case for forever really. Um, I think the other really important myth that I would highlight is just you know the there's a lot of rhetoric, rhetoric around who gets abortions and this image that's always out there about the typical abortion provider. And while we know that um, poor individuals and, and individuals of color are more likely to seek abortion care, which is for many, many reasons unrelated to the, you know, to the things that people commonly think, it, a lot of it has to do with a lot of other um, uh, societal, cultural, structural um, issues, like whether it be racism or, I mean, there's a whole a whole host of reasons why these individuals um, are in need of abortion care more frequently than other groups, but they're not, um, people often look at them as the typical face of the abortion provider, but that's actually not the case. I have done abortions on uh, university professors. I have done abortions on physicians. You know, I have done abortions on lawyers. Like I have done abortions on on all types of different individuals. And so the the perception that it's only a certain type of person that needs to get abortion care is completely false. And and you'd always, you know, I think as more and more people come forward with their stories, you start to realize just how um, how often, you know, what we already know from the data, but people start to really it drives home how common the procedure is, and how, you know, regardless of what you thought the typical abortion prep abortion patient look like actually it's a very very different picture and there are probably multiple people that you know who you don't know they had an abortion but they had to get one so i think that's a, probably a myth i would really highlight is that you know you can't ever make assumptions about who's going to need the care i've seen many a patient who came in and said i was against abortion i never thought i would need an abortion and yet here i am and they aren't the, this you know the typical patient that people think about Definitely agree with everything that has been said. Um, I will have my medical hat on for one my, one very quick uh, answer, which is that 
abortion is safe. There is no amount of pretending that it's not um, to change that fact. Um, that we certainly hear a lot of rhetoric from the other side about how dangerous it is. It's just not. Everybody let that go. Abortion is safe at all gestational ages, and it is much safer than continuing a pregnancy to term. So I think that's an important myth to let go of. But beyond that, I would say in the broader sense, um, the myth that anti-abortion work is about and is about abortion at all is a myth. It is about misogyny. It is about keeping people in their place, whether that be their class structure or their gender structure or their sort of racial groups, right? It is about control um, of people and it is not about saving babies. Um, and we know that, right? Because if you look at the um, healthcare policies um, that individuals who are staunchly anti-choice put out in around maternal mortality or maternal health or child health or vaccination programs, education. You know, we have an entire neighborhood that's been smoldering with nuclear waste. Nobody's doing anything about that, right? So when you look at sort of the larger lens of what it means to really want to improve the health and lives of people, um, oftentimes these folks are absent in those circles too. And so I think that just remembering that, you know, attacking somebody's access to reproductive health and choice um, is about much more than whether they should parent this particular pregnancy or not. Thank you, everybody, um, for those uh, varying, varying perspectives, really, really interesting, um, important perspectives. Um, another question that we just got in that would be relevant for everybody um, has to do with the whole, what can we do? You know, folks uh, um, on the line have full-time jobs and want to be able to do um, whatever that they can um, to try to support um, access to healthcare. Um, if you could name one thing or a couple of things um, from your individual perspectives that people could do in their daily lives, what is it that you each would suggest? Mai, we'll start with you again. Sorry, sure. Um, so I think, you know, one thing you can do is find your local organization that's working to maintain or expand access. Right, so this could be um, not just a health center, although it could be a health center, it could be an abortion fund, it could be um, a reproductive justice organization. And find out what's near you and find out what they need. Do they need volunteer time? Do they need money? Do they need something else? Because I think the needs vary um, and, and that's, you know, that's a relatively small ask to do a little bit of research into that. Um, I would say two things. Um, one would be to find a local clinic and volunteer as a clinic escort. Um, it's really good work, particularly if there are demonstrators or protesters there. It can be really helpful to the patients um, in a moment that can be scary or overwhelming for them. So um, you can really have an impact and, and help people in a tangible way by doing that. Um, the other thing I would say is, as attorneys, there are ways to get involved um, both in your legal capacity and just as le leaders in your communities. Um, you can you know, take on pro bono cases, um, get involved in, in cases that way. Um, but you can also just use your platform as an attorney to speak out in op-eds or in other public forums um, to give your perspective and to advocate for uh, widespread legal and safe abortion access. Great. Joel and I are on the same wavelength because I was thinking <laughs> the same thing. We're talking to a group of lawyers and there's a lot of folks out there who may um, be able to, uh, to, to may need some help. Um, I think the other thing um, that I would say is just education, right? So making people aware. So whether that is through social media, which is you know a common way that we reach out to multiple groups, you can reach out to a lot of people um, in, in, with a short message, but um, education and awareness about the things that we've been talking about during this webinar, things that a lot of people, um, again, may not, you know, they have an overview or, or have an image or a picture or a thought that's related to rhetoric that's being pushed by those with an agenda to counteract that and to say, hey, you know what, in reality, this is what we're talking about. You know, reality, we know it's safe. In reality, most procedures are happening, you know, very early in a pregnancy, not um, at the end of pregnancy, which is, is has been tried to be promoted. You know, in reality, everybody, no matter who you are, um, everybody of all walks of life may need to get abortion care. Um, so I think, you know, really trying to dispel the myths 
um, pushing the word out, you know, it, it kind of limited uh, related to what Mai was saying. Uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities uh, often for being able to help with fundraising, to push out when there are rallies that need support, um, when, you know, just any number of, of different activities that may be going on, like using social media as a platform to say, hey, this is what's happening, um, you know, get the word out there, or um, educating about some of the things that we've been talking about or other um, topics that, that would make people more aware and hopefully bring more people into understanding of, of what the problem is and really why it is a problem the way it is. And I'm gonna just sort of keep that same record going <laughs> and say, um, talk about it. Talk about it at the daycare, talk about it at your dinner party, talk about it when you're at that lecture about immigration litigation, like they are all connected. And so the more you talk about it, um, you know, there's a little bit of a joke that goes around in my house where if we're going to meet somebody new, it's can I have five minutes before you start talking about abortion in this new space? Um, but <laughs> The truth is a couple of things happen is one, you find more supporters than you do anything else. Um, and you sort of give people permission then to share with you that they support. And then you sort of now have this new cohort of folks who can be energized to do things, um, all of which have been mentioned above. Um, but also it helps to normalize it, right? That if we just talk about abortion like it is, like it's just a thing, it's normal, um, then um, I think people, um, can, as, as Serena said, be educated about what the reality is. Um, I can't tell you how many times I tell folks about what happened, what's happening in Missouri, and they're like, no, that's not happening. Like, that can't be real. Like, how many times have all of you heard, like, what do you worry about? Rose not going away. And I'm like, hi, have you been to Missouri? Um, so uh, so I think that's, that's the other important thing is helping people know what the reality is. So all of us are in agreement. Talk about it, write about it, publish about it, tweet about it, <laughs> be vocal about it. Um, thanks, everybody. And I would just like to echo, too, I mean, just in the last two days, some of these suggestions um, that the panelists has, have just given have been incredibly important with Planned Parenthood and Metropolitan Washington's work. Today, we have um, many, many protesters out front in D.C. The March for Life is tomorrow, and we could not have um, the, 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 the escorting that Joel had mentioned. Um, uh, we could not we cannot thank our escorts enough. Our patients are so lucky to have them in light of having the protesters out there. We wish that there weren't protesters, but there are. And so having escorts be able to um, walk and have a friendly face um, and um, at, literally escort our patients um, into the building is an incredible service. So if that's something that might work for you. It is something that right this moment um, is helping our patients here at Planned Parenthood Metro Washington. Um, additionally, Serena mentioned that yesterday we had an important vote in DC for proactive legislation. And we could not have done that without the help of volunteers in all different capacities. And it's not one size fits all. If you're somebody who likes to write, you wanna write an op-ed and wanna put yourself out there in that way, that is helpful to us. If you're somebody who doesn't wanna do that, but you wanna um, stand in a, in a pink or purple t-shirt um, and, um, and, and shout and rally, that is helpful and essential to show the support. If you're somebody who wants to make sure that um, everybody knows that, that you like to throw parties and you wanna make sure that everybody knows um, what reproductive health care really means, um, uh, connecting with your local, as Maya mentioned, your, um, your local um, reproductive health advocacy organization and helping them spread the word is um, really helpful. And social media is really important. Our council members yesterday were commenting on the support that they're getting through social media. It helps them and then it helps us be able to prioritize reproductive health care with our legislators at all counts. Um, so thank you, everybody. Another question that's come in, and Dr. Floyd, this is specifically for, um, for, uh, for you and for Dr. McNicholas, um, talking about the American Medical Association or other medical groups. Um, uh, is the AMI or other medical groups doing any work making um, mifepristone and misoprostol easier to dispense and get? And is there any legal work happening to help more doctors navigate the process that you're talking about of getting prescribing privileges? Colleen, do you want to go first? Or sure. Um, so yes, there is some of that work going on. Um, unfortunately, in the U.S., mifepristone is regulated is highly regulated under FDA um, protocols, but there is tons of work being done, particularly on the American College of OBGYN side, um, not only to sort of help undo that um, that particular regulation, but also to provide the evidence, obviously, that would um, support that change. So there is tons of work being done. Um, it is certainly a slow-growing process. Um, 
but yes, it is it is being done. Uh, Misoprostol, on the other hand, is actually fairly widely available. It actually was first approved by the FDA for um, treatment of ulcers, stomach ulcers, um, and we use it in obstetric care broadly for like a million things. Um, and so that is a medication that every physician is able to prescribe um, and that many pharmacies do carry. Um, now, certainly there are some, and we could probably do a whole nother webinar of pharmacy refusal uh, to, to prescribe or dispense, I should say, um, an already prescribed prescription for mesoprostol. But that medication is um, not tightly regulated like the mifepristone, um, but there is work being done um, on uh, the national side to, to be able to help roll that back. Um, I think another important thing to, to mention is actually we did have a little bit of a win. So it used to be that there was the FDA approved regimen for medication abortion, and then there's the evidence-based uh, regimen. And the difference was that with the evidence, um, the FDA approved regimen, it required 600 milligrams of misoprostol, I'm sorry, of mifepristone. Mifepristone is a very expensive drug. It's about $90 per pill, which is a, each pill is about 200 milligrams. So um, and then it required the FDA regimen, in addition to requiring 600 milligrams of mifepristone, also required you to give the mesoprostol in the office, um, which meant that patients had to come had to come back for a second visit. Um, and then the route that they they had to end up taking it was also regulated. But fortunately, in 2016, um, there was a revision on that, and so we were um, able to make the the FDA approved regimen in line with what the evidence shows. The evidence supports the ability to be able to use 200 milligrams, so it's a third of the original dose. So obviously for multiple reasons, makes it much um, a much better option. And then patients could, um, the dose of the mesoprostol will slightly change as well as the timing and the location where patients could take it. So that went a long way to help um, because in some of the states, they were requiring that if you know if you were doing medication abortion, you had to use the FDA approved regimen, which had some onerous requirements that were difficult for patients. But when we were able to make it more in line with what the evidence actually supports as being more effective, easier, um, you know, resulting in in uh, um, better outcomes for patients, then um, it uh, that that was a win. So we were were happy that that happened. So it was a you know a step in the right direction. I mean, we like to be able to get. To get rid of the regulations altogether, but that was a, a small victory. The other thing is is really, uh, you know, there are states that require that medication abortion be administered by a physician, and so there are um, definitely states that are working at trying to expand um, the ability to provide abortion care to advanced um, practice clinicians. Which, when you think about it, we're giving medications, right? We're giving someone a pill to take. Um, so why would an, a an APC not be able to do that? But that's something else that could really help with access. And, and so there's definitely some work being done with different groups and in different areas to try to, uh, to, to make that happen. Thank you. And I'm cognizant that we're getting to the end of our time. I think that we probably have time for one more question. Um, it, uh, before we do, there was a request for the information about the um, rally on March 4th for oral arguments in June Medical Services v. Gee. Um, uh, what the slide said before is for more information, please email lawyersnetworkinfo at reprorights.org. Again, that's lawyers network info at reprorights.org. And I would encourage you also to follow social media for DC based um, advocacy organizations in um, the reproductive health space. And there will be lots of information closer there too. Um, the final question before we wrap up um, again for Dr. Uh, Floyd and um, Dr. McNicholas, if we could just quickly go over, there's a question about is there a way to prepare more medical students to perform abortions? And um, there's an example that Maine passed a law allowing advanced practice clinicians to perform abortions. However, the state of Maine is finding that many advanced practice clinicians don't have the necessary training to perform the procedure. Are there medical groups in the way that if, when, how, which used to be known as law students for reproductive choice or um, those kinds of law student organizations um, is uh, for abortion providers um, like for law students? There is, a, there is, there is a definitely um, a new focus, not a new focus, actually a continuing focus on making sure that um, physician trainees are um, trained to competency to provide abortion care. And that really can include, as Serena said, not just OBGYNs. Uh, there are emergency room physicians and primary care physicians and all sorts of physicians who are trained to dispense medication and so could also um, be trained uh, very easily uh, in the provision of medication abortion. Um, I will say that there's a separate um, 
tragedy happening across the United States, which is really impacting our ability to train um, upcoming OBGYNs, and that is um, Catholic hospital merger um, takeovers, where um, whether you, if you are an OBGYN residency program or a training program in an institution that is religiously affiliated, you are required by um, that institution to abide by their religious um, health directives. And so there are a, a huge number of OBGYNs who are interested um, and capable um, but aren't getting training because the place that they are doing their training isn't providing it. And then similarly, um, as more and more of these hospital systems are absorbed by religiously affiliated folks um, and our practice of medicine moves to group practices, entire practices, whether they are supportive and capable of providing the care, are, no, are not able to do so under those same sort of rules. And so um, there certainly is a lot of support in ACOG and, and our what we call CREOG, which is our resident education sort of organization, to make sure that folks get the training if they want the training. Um, but it too, like all of this, is sort of fraught with sort of um, the political nature and overlying sort of competing um, issues around who owns the hospital and runs the hospital and all those sorts of things. Thank uh, you. Good. Oh, sorry. Can I jump in? We're at time. If you want to add something real quick and then we'll wrap up. Oh, no, I was just going to comment that there are programs out there that are working. Like, so Medical Students for Choice is a, is a medical student organization that really tries to focus on advocating for learning um, and participating in advocating for abortion care. And then there are specific residency training programs um, that, will, that have residency programs that have training programs specifically to try to get folks trained to competency in abortion care. And that's in family medicine as well as an OBGYN. Okay, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. I hate to cut off this great discussion. I'm sorry to folks um, who put in questions and did not have the opportunity um, to have those, those questions posed. I want to thank everybody on the panel. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time um, and your, your, your thoughtfulness and your expertise. Um, on behalf of the Women's Rights Committee um, at the American Bar Association, I also want to thank my colleague Erica Smock, who is integral in putting together this program, as well as the co-chairs Pamela Herndon and Jessica Stender, and of course, Ali Kiersgaard, who has been running the show from behind the scenes from the American Bar Association. It's always a ton of work and more work than anybody uh, can possibly know, except for the person doing it. So thank you for your hard work. Um, the American Bar Association has asked that I also mention that for more than five decades, the section and its members have worked on hundreds of issues addressing a broad range of civil rights, civil liberties, and international human rights. Today, the section continues to promote policies affecting religious freedom, LGBTQ rights, gender equity, and other significant civil rights issues. Please consider making a donation to our section at ambar, A-M-B-A-R dot org slash donate CRS, and your gift will help make our efforts possible for decades to come. Thank you again, Colleen, Serena, Mai, and Joel, um, and everybody behind the scenes. And thank you for joining us. Take care.